Yeah, I completely agree. And it's always a breath of fresh air when I talk to you or Bart K about um, macros being individual levers and the ratio, the percentage is just something yeah. that happens to be because it happens to be. Yeah. Um, and I've always taught it that way myself. So when bodybuilding we've known forever, pretty much, you base your protein amount based on what allows you to recover, perform, um, feel good, gives you all the vitamins, minerals, things like that. Exactly. Then you tweak the fat around that. Um, the problem I've noticed is when people add in carbohydrates, you can tweak the fat around, but then that carbohydrate adds another lever to the to the wheel. So it makes it more complicated to work someone out. So when I'm getting someone started a carnival diet, it's nearly always, you know, six to eight weeks will transition for a lot of people. Um, then I find their baseline. So I find their protein, their fat gram amount. I talk to them about how they perform in the gym, how they feel. Are they hungry? Are they not hungry? Then I tweak it from there. So for me, getting someone in shape isn't oftentimes giving someone a, a one-time plan. It's usually tweaking things, but working out their baseline yeah. first. Yeah. I think that's that's critical. So a lot of people starting out, just, just get on a diet that makes you feel good, then work from there. Yeah, exactly. And, uh, and the thing is, when they do throw those carbohydrates in because from poor information, what they're doing is they're either engaging the Randall cycle in a low gradient, creating some inflammation, and that's sort of causing some derangements, probably in endocrine systems and other things, and then they listen to some of these repeat people and all that, and then they listen to all this nonsense, um, uh, reductionist nonsense, and then from there they go, oh, I need to put this in, I need to put that in, um, which is like you know, the sort of DMD side, oh, you need this drug to affect that pathway. Well, really? Or, oh, you know, now you've got, you know, you need a COX inhibitor, you need to take aspirin, as if our ancestors took aspirin. That's another nonsense from the Ray Pete fan club, you know. And it just goes on and on, and you go, well, hold on, you guys are just missing it. Well, they say, well, you need to take a su choline supplement to fix some of those, um, you know, issues as well and they go well you know if you just eat enough meat you'll get enough coal unless you've got some real reason to fix to supplement to fix you know or you've got some methylation issues or you've got some exposures to xenoestrogens or whatever way there you may need to supplement but in a naturalistic environment you wouldn't need that sort of stuff we do because we don't live in a naturalistic environment necessarily and so we will make some of these adjustments for modern lifestyle. But let's not argue that this is natural because we don't live in a natural and argue from a position, that, oh, you need more. No, you need more because you're in an environment that potentially creates a whole lot of problems. We're in a blue, blue light environment that actually requires slightly more DHA, not that that was actually the, the default norm for a, you know, a tribal person, but for a modern person may be the case. You may need more, slightly more touring because of the way food's prepared or a lot of other things, you know, compared to the past, you know, freshly slaughtered stuff. There's a lot of nuancing. And the problem that I find really problematic with a lot of influences, even in our space, um, is that they're completely ignorant about all this stuff. And they just tell people do that. And when they're not getting it right, they say, oh, you're not doing it right. No, you don't understand both the modern living consequences on the physiology and you need to make some adjustments potentially due to genetics and a lot of other things. Mm -hmm. And this is where a lot of this sort of stuff is lost, the problem that we sort of suffer in the current thinking is what I find frustrating sometimes because I get people asking me certain questions and I know they're coming because I've seen a video of some other person who said some reductionist nonsense and then they come to me and they actually ask me and I have to explain it um, to them why it's so wrong. Mm. I, I do get that a lot myself in the comment section about some videos. So recently, another keto carnivore bodybuilder in this space came out the day before I released a video about taking carbohydrates between workouts or in, in, in workouts, something like that. I think he's saying something like 25 to 35 grams inch a workout. Um, then my kind of video was in, in opposition of his thoughts. I didn't realize he's going to release that video, but mine was already mm -hmm. premiered to release after his video, which is like complete opposition. Um, and I just sort of said, look, I, I don't see this happening with anyone. I don't see anyone getting a better training effect from adding in carbohydrates. 
assuming they're doing the carnival diet properly, they're fat adapted, they're eating enough fat with enough protein. Um, but his anecdote seems to be completely different to mine. I mean, it's very strange that we've we fall upon the same sort of path or um, population group of people training, perhaps young people, yet we've got completely opposite mm. clientele. I mean, how does that work? Well, I, I think to a, to a large extent, it's a lot of people have been trained or been influenced, especially on social media, by reductionist thinking. And so all they do is just parrot that reductionist thinking. They can't think outside that box. And it's like, and you notice that because when you argue with them, they just repeat the same thing and you're going, you don't really understand this, do you? You know, you just don't get it. And this is why nobody will argue with Bart because he'll call them out and he'll point to these things. And that's mm. why they don't argue with me for the same reason. Um, I noticed I came across a, a recent repeat um, crackpot site and uh, I'm actually... They actually did um, comment about me and they actually put me in the same vein as Bart. They said, those two are, you know, pretty much it was all, you know, the negative that we were unfriendly, we're hostile, <laughs> we're, we're really dangerous, we should be avoided like the plague. We're crackpots, both of us, and a whole lot of other things. And I go, well, if we are, why don't you come and debate us, little kids, so we can, you know, teach you a few things. Because, you know, mm. you do not understand a lot of things and you're viewing the world in a very narrow, reductionist way and you're making claims that are not supported by actual, you know, proven physiology, how things work. You know, you can't claim, because this is the big thing about the stress hormone, you know, gluconeogenesis is very stressful. Well, how can it be very stressful when it actually, it's a, you know, the type of process for gluconeogenesis uses hydrolysis, uses very little energy. You know, it's just mm. nonsense. The whole view, the whole reason when you go into ketosis, you go off sugar, the reason why you get an elevation in cortisol initially is because it's very stressful for the body to transition. It's a transition thing. Then it comes back down to baseline once you get over the transition period. It's an adjustment that actually happens. And if you actually do the reverse, like when you go into sugar, you'll also get an increase in stress because you're actually shutting out hormone-sensitive lipase by elevating um, you know, insulin and you can't access energy and you mm. feel like rat shit. And what you do is your cortisol spikes. So in the reverse way, the same thing happens. It's a transition issue that actually happens, you know. So your body mm. <laughs> takes a period of time to transition. If you, And there's research showing that. And we know even from anecdotes, you know, people where they will basically end up um, doing that to themselves, but like uh, giving themselves a hypoglycemic sort of <laughs> shock to the system. What does the body do? Well, it has to elevate because you've locked out hormone-sensitive lipase by elevating insulin. You can't access your fat anymore because you've done a bad thing, boo-boo. I'm just being facetious. And what you've done as a consequence of that is, what does the body do? Remember the dawn effect? It raises, what does it do? Mm. It raises cortisol in order to compete with um, insulin, to suppress insulin in order to basically be able to liberate free fatty acids and to produce more sugar in order, via glucagon, in order to basically provide you the energy so you don't die, you idiot. So going either way is an adaptation phase and that's the quickest way of actually seeing that reaction. These are, the, the body's not mm. stupid, guys. It really knows how to adjust even when you do stupid things and you can't accuse the body for doing that sort of thing. That's not chronic. That's not chronic cortisol. That is a transitional state of responding to, you know, a change in the, you know, nutrient, a, a different type of nutrient deprivation or conditions that you've created and the mm. body in a naturalistic environment, that wouldn't happen. Why? 
because you'd only have seasonal stuff and you'd come into it slowly taking some of this sort of stuff and adjusting and then coming out of it in just a few months and all that. That's what would happen. And it would be also low grade, just enough to put a bit a bit of additional um, fat stores from the fructose. And the fructose doesn't really raise insulin that high anyway. So you can actually switch much easier. It's one of those. So fruit, yes, was something in the interglacial periods, not the glacial periods. That was just fat. We ate more of it and they were fattier, those animals, because they needed to be for thermal to insulate themselves and to produce also more um, uh, uncoupled, you know, in it, energy from uncoupled mitochondria in um, brain adipose tissue to basically warm themselves up like the Inuit do. And I've done a video on that covering that stuff like that. So really this is a, this is just a response, a physiological response to a change in um, macronutrient ratios that are coming in. That's all it is. You can do it in the reverse, as I said, either way to make a big fuss about that and say, Oh, you know, that's what the keto diet is stressful. Well, so going back to a low fat to, to a low fat diet, high carbohydrate diet is just as stressful. It will cause the same stress responses, you know, and it's an adjustment phase. I mean, this is just nonsense. And there's plenty of um, literature out there showing that. But they are selective, obviously, because they have, you know, a narrative and propaganda to push forward to ignorant people. And they seem to be doing pretty good because the algorithm seems to be pushing that sort of nonsense. Yeah, if, if you're talking about who I think you are, yeah, it definitely seems <laughs> that in um, Costa Rica, it's a bit more beneficial to be out there, I think. <laughs> yes, yes. Yeah. Him as well. All right. Because he's, he's, right, yeah, he's got a full-blown Ray Pete as well. <laughs> Let's be honest. Yeah, yes. Build muscle and lose fat on the carnivore diet.